Over the course of the past five weeks, Star Citizen has been releasing a series of weekly missions that are tied together in a linear story arc building to an eventual big grand finale called the Xenothreat, where a militant faction invades the Santa system from Pyro and players are tasked with defending it. It's Star Citizen's first attempt at making a largely narratively driven theme park style set, and it's something that us veteran MMO players should be intimately familiar with. After all, it's a pretty standard type of mission in the toolbox of any developer. Why then this is such a big deal is because this is the first time Star Citizen has attempted to do a mission set like this. So then how did it go? Was it fun? Well, I played all five missions and I wanted to take you through my experiences with them and let you know how I felt about it. And if by the end you think I did a good job and deserve it, please don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button to show your support. One thing that definitely is good though is the sponsor of today's video, Incogni. You probably already know that whenever you do something online, there's a huge number of companies that collect your information. Stuff like your address, social security number, employment history, etc. But what you might not know is that they buy, sell, and trade that information. Some of those companies use that information to do things like adjust your credit score and to do more nefarious things. Worst of all, if any of those companies get hacked, your identity could be at risk, which is exactly what happened to me a couple years ago when my identity was stolen. That's where Incogni can help. There are laws that allow you to force those companies to delete your data and Incogni knows exactly how to use them. Their service automatically reaches out and applies the appropriate law and language to get them to remove the data. I just signed up and found out that there were over 90 companies with my personal information, so no wonder I keep getting invited to join in annoying scam investor groups. So if you want to be just a bit more sure that your personal information isn't getting into the wrong hands, or maybe you just want to be free of some of those spam emails, you can get your personal data off the internet today with Incogni. Just head on over to incogni.com slash morphologist and use my code morphologist to get 60% off an incogni purchase. And don't worry, if you don't like it, you can always get your money back with their 30 day money back guarantee. Again, that's incogni.com slash morphologist and use code morphologist to get 60% off your order. For the first week, we got something called the Intel Raid, which involved us locating a bunker within the Stanton system in which was a Xenothreat cell. The cell had a series of servers within that bunker that we needed to extract information from to find out what the Xenothreat was up to. There were five of these missions total as part of this first phase of increasing difficulty with the fifth most difficult one actually having some heavy mobs that would drop some pretty cool and rare kits, including a Mantis helmet that's no longer purchasable on the website. And actually the decal it came with was never purchasable. But it wasn't as simple as just neutralize the enemy because as the data was extracted, the servers would occasionally randomly overheat, requiring us to search the bunker for the code to unlock the ability to stop it from overheating. Failure to do so within a time frame would result in the server overheating and the data being lost, requiring us to start over. And if all the servers ended up being destroyed throughout the course of the mission, then the mission would fail. So basically you need to monitor the server room for overheating while it uploads and then fight off random mobs as they try to stop you and then search for code to stop the servers from overheating when they do. So it became incredibly frantic in a really exciting and engaging way, especially when you had friends with you and you need to work together and communicate in order to successfully complete the mission. Personally, I like this idea of having multiple objectives happening simultaneously to get you really into the experience. Just going down there to kill all the mobs is kind of a thing that's been done a million times. So seeing them leverage some of the tech that's in the game already to make a more compelling mission is I think exactly the direction that I'd like to see them go with more missions. The only downsides I saw to this was the obvious one that server performance wasn't always great and the AI would sometimes just not be responsive, but that's not really that actionable of feedback. They know the servers are not doing well and they're working to fix them. The thing that I think that it could do better in the future would be to leverage more of what Star Citizen excels at and that's it having the different scale of experiences going from space down to the bunker. I think it would be great to have to fight your way in ships to get to this bunker and then fight your way with just FPS combat. Because not everybody is going to be into the FPS combat, so having a bit of a balance between both, I think for this mission, could make it a little bit more rich and interesting. 
Week two was something called Priority Targets. In this mission set, we were tasked with finding three different parties that were scouting the Stanton system in order to extract digital keys from them to gather additional intelligence. This involved us destroying the ships and then going out in EVA to find something called an encryption key that we'd then need to return to a nearby station in order to submit to the local security forces. Now this mission set was actually pretty easy, but the problem with it in my mind was that it felt a little bit too similar to bounty hunting, and I think that's probably the mission set that this was based off of. For your run-of-the-mill bounty hunting mission for grinding up the bounty hunter tree, I think that this is fine, but for a mission, I would prefer this be a little bit more special and bespoke. For example, instead of having to blow the ship up, perhaps you would need to disable it and board it to extract the key, with a lose condition being that if you destroy the ship, the key is destroyed along with it. But I feel like they're headed in the right direction. Requiring us EVA out to collect the cargo leverages yet another part of Star Citizen that's unique to the game, the ability to leave your ship physically and go out and collect something seamlessly. So including the need to wreck dive, I think, would just make this a lot more interesting. For week three, we got something called the Xenothread Incursion, and it was a group of five server-wide missions that everybody in the server would take along with you to stop some mini invasions by the Xenothread that was comprised of a series of hammerheads, vanguards, and light fighters. The good thing about this being a server-wide mission was that you really didn't need a group to complete it if there were other people doing the mission alongside you, but the issue with it was that if you didn't arrive fast enough that the mission would be completed without you and you wouldn't get credit if you weren't on site doing damage. Now as far as the combat goes, it was enjoyable as far as space combat in Star Citizen is enjoyable. I did it with a group of friends with some turrets and I found that pretty fun. It's cool to see ships explode, but this really comes down to whether or not you enjoy space combat in Star Citizen. What I think this mission lacked was context and a compelling objective. Just blowing things up I don't think is that exciting given that's what happens all the time in Star Citizen if you've played it a lot. I think it'd have been much more interesting to perhaps locate this mission near the Pyro Stanton jump point as that's where they're coming from, they're in the Pyro system. Perhaps their objective could also have been a lot more clear. Maybe they were trying to come through the jump point to destroy defenses around the jump point station and your objective would be to stop them from doing so and stop further incursions. This would give players a clear line to hold, and let's just face it, those jump points look incredible. What a great backdrop to do an event to. But it doesn't necessarily need to be that. There could be some other lore reasons why they would be already very far within the Stanton system. Whatever the case is, I just think having another objective aside from blow up the enemy would have been a bit more interesting and less run in the mill. Week 4 though was a lot stronger than week 3 and I would even argue it was maybe the best of the bunch, because it was actually a two-parter with the first part being a pretty impactful red herring. Basically the Xenothreat were shutting down comrades around the Stanton system which actually affected everybody within the server that was playing the game regardless of whether or not they were participating in the event. The communication arrays are basically what report crimes to the local security forces, so without a comrade up, players could be destroyed by other players without any consequence. So there's already clear motivation for players to want to participate to stop the Xenothreat from shutting these comrades down. But what made these missions even more interesting was the way that they played out. So like your typical comrade mission, if you've played them before, you needed to go inside to re-enable it by pressing a button located within it, which required you EVA out to the comrade station and go within it. However, in the case of these ones, they actually had mines riddled about them that you would have to disable in order to access that button panel. But there was another twist. After re-enabling the comrade, the Xenothreat would try to re-approach to re-establish connection and flip it back in their favor, and if you didn't destroy them before they completed that objective, then you would have to redo the mission or it would fail. And the way that worked would be that they would just be within proximity for a certain amount of time and if the bar ticked over to 100% then the mission would fail. I really liked the way this was set up, it added additional pressure to an already existing mission to make it a lot more exciting. But the best part of this was that after the third mission was completed, that you'd get the secret last objective, which in the story of the mission was that they were actually trying to take over security post Korea the entire time and are currently holding it. So players were then tasked with going to Korea to retake it from the Zeno threat by eliminating any who are still holding the station and by switching it back to a friendly mode. 
And just like the Comrades, these locations are also tied into other mechanics of Star Citizen. This is the only place that pirates can clear their crime stats, so you would occasionally get pirate players coming and fighting their way through other players to try to get to the Security Council. Honestly, this mission is pretty good the way it is. The only way it could be improved is maybe by introducing new tech as it comes online. For example, maybe enemy ships are able to land on the pads outside and deploy additional troops for reinforcing. That way you've got to defend the station from the outside as well as the inside. But you know, that, that's a bit more complex. And like I said, I think it's good the way it is. Of all the missions, this one I think was maybe the most interesting. For the final mission, part 5, it was a single resupply mission called Resupply Request, where players were tasked with going to a crashed wreck site on the ground on a planet somewhere and recovering three different types of boxes to be returned to the Pyro Stanton Jumpgate. And I actually don't think this mission was that bad. It wasn't as exciting as part four or as interesting as part one, but in the instance that I played, there were enemy ships spawning in above and shooting our support ships, meaning that we had to very quickly get the packages and get out before the transport ship was destroyed. And this gave us a little bit of extra pressure that was unexpectedly exciting. But I believe this was pretty hit and miss. Not everybody had this experience. so. One way that this could be improved would be more consistently have ships coming in to stop you from collecting the supplies, in addition to having perhaps some NPCs on the ground defending it from the ground. I mean, if tech were to come online to support it, I also think having maybe some ground vehicles like a Nova Tank or a Ballista there to defend the site would be also a bit more compelling and maybe finally give a reason to use the A1 or A2 in a mission type setting. There were also some technical issues with this mission because of, you guessed it, server performance, but, you know, again, I, it's, it's something that CIG knows about, but I'll, I'll just mention it here again. I'm definitely repeating myself. So altogether, I think these missions did a really good job of building anticipation for an already excellent event. I feel like Xenothread is pretty much the best event that CIG currently has, as it has a really good balance of combat and non-combat gameplay to give most people something to do in feel like they're participating and helping towards an eventual victory. Aside from the potential improvements I outlined when I went over each of these missions, I also think that they could have been better organized to build up anticipation more clearly. I felt like the box mission at the end was a bit of a letdown, a bit of a deflation after the big epic event that the Korea mission was. So perhaps instead they could have put the Korea mission at the end, or maybe put the modified version of the incursion event at the end where it takes place at the Pyro Jump Gate with the box mission being more towards the start of the whole series. Since this is also starting to turn out to be something like a vertical slice of what we can expect from future big missions and events, it may also be good for the next version of this to include some additional mocap and voice acting from Anna who does Ruana Dooley, the civilian defense force agent who's been giving out this mission set. Perhaps we could go visit them at their office and it could feel quite a bit more immersive. And well, to be honest, that's just kind of standard for a lot of MMOs to have a physical person you need to go to to get the mission. But the whole event was a bit poisoned by something that I've yet to address, and that's the reward. When this event was initially announced, it was announced in concert with a ship sale, with the idea that the reward for completing all of the missions would be that you would get a free upgrade to a rare ship from a ship that you would need to purchase for $170. And I feel like this could have been done better in so, so many ways. Star Citizen already has this negative perception of purely trying to go after people with deep pockets and like the game only cares about making more money without delivering a gameplay experience. To have an event centered around a ship sale feels like once again Star Citizen is focused more on trying to make more money as opposed to delivering something after so many years of development. Now personally, I'm a content creator and I cover the project, so I know the development intimately and I know that they're trying to deliver something that's fun and unique in this gaming space. But the problem is, is that that's not the perception from outside of the Star Citizen community, and that's what the marketing team really needs to be thinking critically about. If you're going to promote an experience, an event, then you should try to promote it, in my view, around the experience itself, to prove that Star Citizen has become a game now and that there's something fun and exciting to want to play. 
and then afterward try to sell them something. Being so in your face with a ship sale feels too on the nose, too obvious, and a bit of an amateurish move. But it also creates a perception among existing players that CIG just doesn't care about people who have already spent money. Look, it's like I already spent some money for the project, right? And in exchange, I was hoping to get not just the ship as part of that pledge, but a fun experience, that whole promised Star Citizen universe that they've been talking about for years. But instead, what happens is I get an event where the reward is that I need to spend more money? Look, I think that the reward should definitely be first and foremost a great gameplay experience, and then maybe some cool trinkets that you can take home. But the event was advertised alongside the reward of this ship that you needed to spend money in order to get the reward for. And that's really where the problem is coming from. If they had instead added in that there are other rewards, or perhaps promoted them first and foremost as rewards that you only get from playing the game, then I think this wouldn't even be a discussion. And by the way, if you're thinking about that cool armor set I talked about at the beginning of this video, that's not bound to your account after you loot it, so once they do a reset, it's gone forever, and they do those resets pretty much every other patch. And that's why later CIG added in a set of armor as an additional reward for people who have not made any additional purchases. But unfortunately, in my view, it was too little too late. So going into the future, I would very much hope that they first and foremost focus on the gameplay and how they can reward players for completing the experience, and then they can think about how they can sell some ships. If they can do a great job of making a fun experience with some fun and exciting rewards, then I think they can organically generate interest in spending money. At least, that's the way that I think things should be done. But anyway, I'm looking forward to Xenothreat and hopefully experiencing it in the new 3.23 release. But what are your thoughts? How do you feel about this recent mission set? Do you feel like it's a good first go at a theme park? Or do you feel like me that there could be some improvements and that, well, the rewards probably should have been done better? Let me know down in the comment section below. And if you like the video, you know what to do. Hope to see you guys in the next one.